In class today, our lecture was a repeat of the previous podcast where we discussed the factors that influence atomic radius uh, in greater detail. The cool part about ionic radius, which will also be a little bit of a rerun, is that the trends that the ions follow for their size is exactly the same as that for at atomic radii. So one of the things I need you to pay careful attention to as the slide changes, go ahead and write in the fact that positive ions are always smaller than their neutral atoms. Now pay close attention to this picture. Here's why. The electron that gets lost is the outermost. Here it goes. Boom, gone. Outermost energy level is now gone. The atom has turned into a positive ion. Losing electrons makes you more positive. You lose negativity, so you become a plus ion, and you become smaller as well. And I wouldn't worry too much about what you see here. Negative ions are always larger than their neutral atoms. And the reason for that is not necessarily because their nuclear attraction is less. I'm not exactly sure what that means. But if you were to pretend now that I'm going to put some extra electrons into an outer energy level, not this one because it's full, but just pretend, there is greater electron-electron repulsion. Like charges repel, when electrons push each other away, they take up more space. So negative ions also follow the same trend as their... Um, atomic parents. However, they start out larger. Now, you can look at this chart here, but for me the trends are a little bit hard to discern in terms of what's happening with the trend. But <clears throat> going down a group, definitely both anions and cations. Anions would be over here the negatively charged ions, and cations would be where the metals are, the positively charged. They get larger going down. I think this next graphic does a better job of showing the picture. When you see a gray hemisphere, that's representing what half of an atom of lithium would look like. So make that thing a whole gray circle, and that's the size of the lithium atom. 1.34, probably angstroms, it doesn't say, in diameter. Maybe nanometers, I'm not sure. Regardless, the pink part that you see here in the core, that's the pink hemisphere, that represents half of a lithium ion. Notice that, these pink ions that are positive as I go down any metallic column on the periodic table are getting larger in size. So positive cations start out smaller than their parents, but the trend is the same. Ions get larger top to bottom. And the trend left to right is also the same. Please notice that the pink colored positive ions are decreasing left to right. On the right side, now blue represents the larger oxide ion, larger than the gray atom that it originally came from. Oxygen is only two columns away from the nearest noble gas. You give it two more electrons, it thinks it's isoelectronic with the noble gas to the right. It has the same electron configuration. It's become stable. And in doing so, packing two extra electrons, that's why it's two minus, increases electron-electron repulsion. So the ions that are negative start out larger than the parents, but follow the same trends. Bigger going down. A little hard to see on these pictures, but you have to trust me. Smaller going from left to right. So that's our trends for atomic and ionic radius. This last concept for tonight's vodcast is one of the more difficult ones, maybe the second to last one, and it's called ionization energy. Chemists have measured the amount of energy required not to move necessarily a single electron from an atom in its gaseous state, but a mole of electrons. Regardless, you can think of ionization energy as how strongly an atom's nucleus holds on to its valence electrons. If you have a low ionization energy, it's easy to remove electrons. If it's high, it's difficult. And a word got left off here. The bigger the ionization energy is, the more difficult it is for another element to steal an electron and the word that got left out was, it's another way to measure how easy it is to become a positive ion. So insert the word positive right there. Let's take a closer look at that. 
On this three-dimensional graphic, you can see that ionization energy tends to decrease going down a column, even in the nonmetals and even in the noble gases, although getting them to ionize is a pretty tough, tough uh, trick to pull off. Why is that? Let's connect that to the size of the atoms. Aren't these atoms getting bigger going down a column? Doesn't that make their outermost energy level farther from the nucleus? They have more shielding effect protecting that outermost electron from the pull of the nucleus. It's easily lost. It makes it quite easy to ionize. So that's why cesium on the video of the British periodic table exploded so violently when thrown into water. It much, much more readily gives up its outermost electron than, say, lithium or sodium would. That's our first trend. Notice also <clears throat> that ionization energy is increasing as you go left to right. Now first off, kind of just ignore the noble gases. We've only made a few compounds with them, so saying that they can be ionized isn't exactly a true statement. Over here, we start with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. It becomes more, sorry, I want to go left to right, excuse me. As I go from left to right, with a few bobbles, if you want to know why it goes little, big, little, take AP chemistry. But for right now, let's ignore the exceptions and say from left to right, it seems to be getting more difficult to pull off electrons. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, if you're in column six or seven, you are not a loser of electrons, you're a stealer of electrons. Oxygen would steal two electrons, probably from a metal. Fluorine could steal one, and both of them would not become neon, but become isoelectronic, have the same electron configuration as neon, and therefore become stable. But let's go back to that trend as we march from left to right across the periodic table. You're staying within the same energy level. You're not adding more inner layers of shielding effects, so that stays constant. And every time you bounce over one box, you add one more positive proton to the nucleus. So what you're doing is increasing the effective or nuclear charge and therefore the atom holds more tightly onto its outermost electrons. So that would explain why it gets more difficult as we go from left to right to ionize or take away an electron. Now I think we went through this so I'll go ahead and, and describe it again. Going across from left to right you're getting greater nuclear attraction, so it's more difficult to pull off the electrons. And I said the ionization energy decreases going down. You have two ways to say this. It gets easier the bigger the atoms get because you have loosely held outermost electrons that are shielded from the pull of the nucleus. Or you can say it's harder to pull off the outer electrons going up a column Atoms are smaller, shielding effect is less, the nuclear charge is hanging on to those electrons more tightly. But in general, metals are relatively easily ionized, so that's why they always make positive ions. Nonmetals have high ionization energy. They always become negative ions. Okay, and this is a restatement of what we talked about. Again, Doherty's brain likes to go top to bottom. Top to bottom, ionization energy gets lower and lower. Left to right, ionization energy increases. But you go ahead and write in the arrows and the explanation for how it works for your brain. Now notice that you can't just necessarily pull off one electron. For example, magnesium can have two electrons lost. It's in Roman numeral column two. Silicon could have three electrons lost. But what you're looking at here, this I1 and 2 and 3, this is the energy needed to pull off a mole of the first outermost electron of sodium. I2 means how much energy would it cost you in kilojoules per mole to pull off a second electron and so on. So it's kind of interesting. Sodium only has one outermost electron and it basically says, go ahead, take my electron. I'd rather you do that anyways, because when I lose an electron, I become isoelectronic with, I believe, again, neon. But don't you dare try to get sodium's second electron. Notice that it's about nine times harder to do that. And that's because once it loses one electron, it's stable. Leave it alone. Magnesium has two outermost electrons. It's in Roman numeral column two. You can have its first electron. 
It's about twice as hard to pull off the second electron, but no way is it going to give you that third electron without a whole lot of energy being put into that system because once it's lost to, now it's isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas, and so on. It's really kind of a misnomer to say that any of the noble gases have I, or can be ionized, but um, for now, there's some values being shown there that of the group, they're the hardest ones to ionize at all. Okay, so I'm going to actually skip and do one very simple concept because I would like to do one easy and one difficult one each day. And the easy one is right here on the second to the last slide, which is really basically the last slide. We can rank the chemical reactivity of the elements on the periodic table. And all you need to do is remember the British periodic table video. Lithium and sodium kind of fizzed in water, go down the alkali metals, boom, rubidium and cesium are like blowing up the containers. So as you look at the periodic table, the most active or reactive metal is the element cesium, down here in the lower left corner, only ignoring francium because it's radioactive. Now over on the right hand side, remember from the video they would say fluorine is the T-rex of the periodic table? So kind of remember that guy in the upper right corner. Notice again, we're ignoring the noble gases. The most reactive non-metal is fluorine, and then things get calmer as you go down the column. We don't store any fluorine gas in our lab. We don't have any hydrofluoric acid. Too crazy. But I have plenty of solid sodium um, sitting in the back room in our chemical storage because it's a pretty stable compound. So again, the periodic table has split itself into two parts. On the metal side, metals get more reactive going down. And on the non-metal side, they get less reactive going down. And that's it for that second easy part. We'll return again to talk about more difficult concepts of things like electronegativity and electron affinity, as well as some easy periodic trends. See you guys tomorrow.